James chapter 1. This will be our second session in the book of James. I'm really excited about this study, and uh, hopefully you'll get something out of this tonight, and both in the, here in the study and also in our discussion groups. The title message tonight is God's Testing of Our Faith. God's Testing of Our Faith. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Now you may go ahead and say that as we begin tonight that you're not really comfortable with that title. God's testing of our faith. Does God test our faith? Well, I'd say this, you know, if you're, I'm uncomfortable with that title, thinking about God testing our faith. But I would just say to you, welcome to the book of James, because that's exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight. That's exactly what James is going to be talking about in this entire first chapter. When God sends us trials to test our faith in Him. And we think about this, um, you know, we have problems in life. Uh, you know, I've, I've pointed out before, and it's something so obvious that, um, you know, Ty got up and shared this morning. Everybody in this entire church could have said to Ty, man, you know, I really appreciate what you shared. That meant a lot to me. It really impacted me. One person were to say to you, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't care for what you said, and uh, I hope to never hear it again. It walks out. You've got like a 95% success. I mean, you have, you've been a blessing to 95% of the congregation. What are you going to remember the rest of the day? I'm the same way. Matter of fact, I could preach I could preach 100 sermons and get good feedback from people, but one time somebody says something critical or sharp towards me, that's what I'll fix it. That's what I'll remember. Um, it, 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 a time I, I, I was rejected or somebody w was critical, and that's the way our life is with problems. And so that's why this, this chapter is so important, because we're going to face problems in life. We're going to face trials in life. And so this is, going to, this is dealing with that question about trials as we go through these things. When God sends us trials to test our faith in Him. And so chapter 1, beginning verses 1 through 4, if you would please stand in honor of God's Word as we read this together. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. We began by reading verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 1 last week. It's the only verse we looked through just talking about who James was, the powerful testimony, the powerful uh, story of the life of James. We we'll pick up here in verse 1. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy. So James jumps right in. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I'm going to fix this microphone. Hopefully I'll get that, that buzz out of there. I don't know where that came from. That happened last Sunday morning, too. Hmm. All right. Hopefully that'll be fine. But let's, let's go ahead, Lord, in prayer together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time together tonight. And um, God, I just pray your blessing upon your word now as it's been read. Lord, we need, we need to consider this tonight as we consider trials. God, when you, you're telling us in your word to count it all joy when we face various trials, when we fall into different trials. God, that's hard for us to understand. Father, I recognize as we begin this study, as we begin this chapter, God, I recognize how far away I am how far away I am from, from being able to count it joy when things don't go right, when I face trials, and, and possibly even extremely uh, difficult, extreme trials. God, I, I pray that you would reveal that to us and show us, God, how, how we can grow in this way, how we can get to the point to where we can count it all joy when we face various trials, when we can actually live out and do what, what you've told us, what James is instructing us to do, but even more importantly, what the Holy Spirit is instructing us to do, that we can be obedient to this command. Show us how to do that as we look through the more details of this throughout this chapter, that, God, we want to be able to, to be obedient to your word, to this command, that, God, we will be able to count it all joy when we face various trials in this life. But we do thank you for your word, the power of your word, how it challenges us, how it helps us to grow, how it tests us. And I pray, God, that, that tonight would be no exception in that. And that, Lord, as we look through this message tonight, these, these scriptures tonight, and also our discussion groups, that, God, you would bless this time together.
together tonight that all of us, God, would be able to grow from having been here tonight, taking the time out to be here tonight to consider these things together. But we pray to ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. So I want to point out what James is saying here and also what he's not saying. James is not saying, or he's saying that trials, he's saying that trials are not joyful in themselves. There's a reason why he says consider it joy when you fall into various trials. To consider it joy when you fall into various trials. Now let's cut to the chase here and say, well, what kind of trials is he talking about? I mean, you know, what do you consider a trial? What do I consider a trial? This microphone popping, is that a trial? <laughs> you know, it, it's testing my patience. Um, you know, this mysterious popping in the microphone, is that what James is considering a trial? What kind of trials? Well, who is James writing to? Who is he writing to? Who is this letter addressed to? You sit back in verse 1. Twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. What scattered them? What scattered them? It was probably because of the stoning of Stephen. And it was probably also because of the beheading of James. He was killed with the sword, Acts chapter 12, which means he was beheaded. That's James. That's John who wrote John 1st, 2nd, 3rd John Revelation. That's his older brother. He was beheaded publicly. That's what scattered him. And who knows what other arrests, tortures, beatings, executions. When they were scattered, they ran for their lives. I guess something comparable to that today would be in... Um, Remember when we were pulling out of Afghanistan and there were Christians in Afghanistan who were, doing, who, were th who were throwing kids over the fence to try to get them? They were running for their lives. Uh, let me switch this out. And it's no big deal. It's fine. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is testing in a very tiny way what we're talking about. But, but again, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about trials. I mean, and, and we can read those things. We read in Acts, we read Acts chapter 12 um, about James being beheaded. Can you imagine witnessing that? I mean, James is one of the inner three. That's Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. He's one, who, he's one of the guys who witnessed the transfiguration. He had his head cut off. That kind of trial, it would be so scarring to witness that or to go. Imagine if someone in our church was, was murdered for the gospel. And, and it wasn't just murdered by, by some murderer who broke the law, but by, by the authorities. It was legal. It was, it, it was sanctioned by the local authorities. They're the ones who saw to it. <laughs> James is talking about those kinds of trials. And so it'd be, you know, it'd be tempting to say, well, count it all joy when you follow these different trials. Well, you don't understand the trials I'm dealing with. You don't understand the, the trials that James is talking about. Your trials, frankly, just to be honest with you, not, are nothing compared to what James is talking about. That's the challenge here. I mean, when he says trials, when he says temptations, he means trials as bad as it can be. Like what Christians in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, China, what they are enduring. Jake uh, sent me a, a message this week about how, how the persecution in China is being ratcheted up. It's increasing. Things that, that Christians in these areas, that they endure. Now, it's talking about, uh, uh, beginning with here in this chapter, it's talking about those external trials, the persecution, things that come against us externally. Later on in this chapter, he's going to talk about internal trials. That's to come later in this chapter, the next week. But James is saying, he's honestly saying, count it joy when you fall into various trials. And when he says fall into trials, it's kind of like fall into diverse temptations. And, and I like using the term trial there because we're going to distinguish between a trial and a temptation later on in this chapter. When he says when you fall into these temptations, fall into these trials, I mean, that's, it's kind of like um, when somebody falls amongst thieves, suddenly you're surrounded. You're surrounded by trials, all different types of trials. 
I mean, it's not just one thing coming at you, but there's all these different things coming at you when you're completely surrounded. James says, count it joy. But he says, he doesn't say that it's, it's joyful to go through a trial, but he says, count it joy, not for the trial, but for what the trial produces, which is patience, endurance, steadfastness, and actually, the way you know it's described there, knowing this is the trying of your faith, work with patience. Patience is a good, a good translation of that, but it's even a little bit more aggressive than that, a little bit more bold than that. It's tenacity. When you go through trials, it creates a tenacity in you, where where, where you might have quit, but once you have pushed through this trial, it's going to give you a greater tenacity to push through the next trial. An unshakable faith. An unshakable faith. How many of us, how many of our, do we have faith, but our faith is so easily shaken? You know, to look at a pretty extreme example of this, but right in line with the type of trials that James is talking about, you know, I've heard reports, you know, American Christians were afraid to take the gospel to the Middle East. Chinese Christians are not afraid because they've been through trials. They're threatened with beatings or arrest or even execution. They've suffered beatings. They've suffered arrest. They refer to, in China, I've heard pastors refer to, to prison as Chinese seminary. That's where they really learn to trust God is, is going through the, those incredible hardships for the gospel. That's what we're talking about tonight. That's what James is talking about. And what he says there in verse 4 I mean, let patience have her perfect work. What he's saying is don't quit in the middle of the test. See it through. Don't throw in the towel halfway through. Don't give up. As you're going through this trial, you're going through this test, and understand that James is writing to these that have been scattered as, they're, as they're, they have fled from this persecution. They've, ran, they've had to run and leave Jerusalem for their life. James is still there. And we know in 62 AD, eventually it's going to catch up with him. He's going to be executed. But he's writing to comfort them, even though he's still there in Jerusalem in the middle of it with a target on his back. He's writing to comfort them, to encourage them, to challenge them. And he's saying, don't quit in the middle of the test. See it through. That it may produce full maturity so that you may lack nothing. We could stop right there. Now, I already find this challenging tonight. I already find this challenging. Just the first four verses. But I want to go on in, in verses 5 through 8 and, and look at this scripture in context. As I, I've quoted this scripture, I quoted it yesterday morning. What does it say? In, in this context, it says, If any lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You know, this has a specific context. When he's talking about asking for wisdom, it is wisdom, asking God to give us wisdom on how to interpret the trials that we're going through. How should we see this? And how to endure and how to overcome. And wisdom to endure and to overcome the trials that God has sent our way. When we're surrounded by these trials... When we're surrounded, picture this, that you, you fall and you're completely surrounded by these different trials, different things coming at you, looking up to God in faith and asking for wisdom. God, how do I get out of this? I'm surrounded. I don't know. I don't have a plan here. I don't have a way to get out of this. But, it, but it's stopping and looking up to God and asking for wisdom. God, lead me. Show me how to deal with these trials that are coming against me from every side. That's what James is talking about here. To discern what's going on. You know, and I think about this, it, 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 this is so powerful how it can change your perspective on things. When you're going through something in life and you realize if you can just step back from the situation and say, you know, especially if you're experiencing this with other people, you step back and say, wait a minute, I think we're being tested here. I think there's more going on behind the scenes than just some weird circumstance or some, some tragedy, some freak thing that's happened. But if you can step, step back and kind of look around and say, I think, I think there's more going on here. To discern what is going on, to say, I believe we're being tested, it changes your perspective on what you're going through. And James is saying that we need to ask God for wisdom. 
ask, ask for wisdom to understand it and, and how to respond to it and respond to that trial or that circumstance that's coming against us. Not doubting, never doubting God's good purposes and his motives. You need to have that already settled in your mind. Um, as you're going through a trial, you know, we're not doubting God. We're not doubting his good purposes, his good motives. I mean, the mentality should be, you know, if Satan comes against you in, in having faith, if Satan comes against you and says, you know, God is, God's cursed you, God's doing this to, to destroy you, God doesn't love you, doesn't, I mean, you should, your reply to that should be, are you joking? That's, a, I mean, that's, that's, that's absurd, impossible. That's not even on the table. That's not even a category that it, you know that that's false. That kind of attack of warning, you know, is God, does he, does he, is he really carrying out good purposes or is, he, is God good or evil? That's a, that's a stupid question. Of course he's good. You have to have that settled in your mind. And that's what he's describing here. He's saying, the man who's tossed back and forth, I'm not really sure if God, if he's for me or against me, if he's cursing me or if he's willing to... He's saying, that's a ridiculous question. Of course God is good. And that's the most obvious thing in, the, in, in all of the existence is the goodness of God. Of course he's good. If you're still wondering about that, you don't have faith. If you're still wondering, is God good or evil? If, is he out to get me? Am I the hero here and God's the villain? If that's what you're thinking, you don't have faith. And that's what James is, is challenging here. He's saying if you have to ask that question, you do not have faith. You're still an unstable person, an unstable and unbelieving person. But step one is having faith and, and settling that in your mind to know God is good. In fact, he's incapable of not doing, uh, he's incapable of evil. He cannot not do good. At understanding who God is, His nature, He is purely good. Unlike any other, you know, any other person you know, any other human being, He is perfectly good. We never have to question His motives or His purposes. He has told us explicitly, the God, the being that cannot lie has said, as I think, Janet, we were talking about on the way here, Romans 8, 28, that God is, for we know that God is working all things together for the good of those who are the called according to his purpose. We can trust that and know that God is good, and he's working these things for our good. He's made that promise. He said no good thing will he withhold from those that walk uprightly, and God has to keep his promise in that. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall not with him freely give us all things? We, we should never question the goodness of God. What we need to, what, where we need wisdom is not to say, well, is God good or evil? Is he out to get me? But the, the question that we're, we're wrestling with is how is God going to use this for good? We're asking for wisdom to understand how God will use some particular trial to accomplish his good purposes. Not if he will do that, but how he will do that. That's what James is describing here. That's the kind of wisdom that we're asking for. We're coming down to verses 9 through 11. It says, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grass, oh, excuse me, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. So what James is describing here, the fir first thing to think of is that Cancer is no respecter of persons. What killed Steve Jobs? I think it was pancreatic cancer. Oh, oh, you're a, you're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. You've um, you own you know a, a large amount of stock in Apple, a big part of the company. You invented all these all these you know smartphones and everything. All, everything goes back to him and, and kind of how he marketed that. You're dead. Cancer is no respecter of persons. And trials come to everyone, and death comes for everyone. That's a reminder here in this passage, rich and poor. And this reminder can give us wisdom and strengthen our faith through humility. I think it's in the Psalms when it says, Lord, teach, Lord, teach me to number my days. Remind me that, I, hey, I'm, I'm temporal. 
that remembering that fact and having that humility can strengthen our faith. And that's what we're talking about in this chapter. That's the purpose of these trials is to strengthen our faith. But also in addition to that, poverty can be a test. Wealth can also be a test. In fact, I think wealth is an even, even greater test, a more difficult test to test our faith. You think about a slave, for example. And again, you know, as we read through Scripture, a slave in the first century was a piece of property. They were abused. You think about a slave, you're dealing with poverty, but you're also possibly being abused or mistreated. But in faith, what he's saying there, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. He's saying, you know, a slave within the Roman Empire, as he's, as he's writing this to those that are scattered throughout the Roman Empire, he's saying to a slave who is a believer, who is a Christian, in faith, remember who you are in Christ. How you have been exalted to reign with Christ forever, to reign with Christ one day and to reign with him forever. Remember who you are in Christ. Rejoice when you're exalted. Rejoice in your exalted state in Christ. But those, we who are rich, and I would include all of us in this room in this, we who are rich should rejoice when we are humbled, reminding us that we're just like the grass of the field, here today and gone tomorrow. And remembering this can strengthen our faith by protecting us from pride. Remembering this will bless us and increase our faith and will and, and will strengthen our faith. Remembering that. Don't get puffed up. Don't trust in your riches. Trust in God. You can see how that weakens your faith. If you're trusting in your 401k, you're trusting in your wealth, your assets, different things, that can weaken your faith in God. He's saying, you know, remember, remember how temporal you are and how temporal what you possess is. We need to remember that. That strengthens our faith. And then last of all in verse 12, It says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. This crown is not for every Christian, but it is reserved for those who endure and persevere through trials. The way I would phrase it is this. Joseph will receive a crown that David will not receive. You remember the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife? And Joseph endured the temptation and fled. And he paid a price for it. He got thrown in prison for doing the right thing. David went out on the rooftop. He didn't run away. He ran into it. Ran into sin. Ran into adultery. That cost him a crown. But what Joseph experienced, there's a crown that, that he gained through that endurance. And again, all of this is through God. There's no, there's no faith, there's no power, there's no strength in us. All the glory goes to God, and that's a crown that I think will be cast at Jesus' feet. But what, what James is describing here is a crown that's not for every Christian, but it is reserved for those who endure and persevere through trials, through faith, through the gift that God gives, through exercising that faith that God has given. And I say that tonight as we get ready to close. As hard as it is to imagine, you know, do not pity North Korean Christians. Do not pity North Korean Christians. Pray for them, love them, but do not pity them. God knows what he's doing. They're not cursed. They're blessed. And we're going to, one day we're going to see how blessed they are. I've heard a figure of something like 900,000 Christians in North Korea. In fact, I, um, I, heard a, uh, I heard a young girl who had escaped into China, who had escaped from North Korea into China, and she was reporting back on the house churches, the underground churches in North Korea. And she, this was her report was basically what I just said, do not pity us. We're happy. We're joyful. We know the Lord. In fact, and this girl was going back to North Korea because she wanted to go back and strengthen the church. She didn't want to run away from it. She wanted, she wanted to go back and strengthen the church. But she said, we're joyful. We're happy. We're blessed. Do not pity us. We're blessed. I heard that account. I think that was through um, Open Doors where, where they were reading this letter that she had left behind when she was there in China. God knows what he's doing, and there's a crown for them. And I, I've heard over and over again about Christians, persecuted Christians, who say they pity us in the U.S. because our faith is so weak. 
It's never tested. It's never tried the way that theirs is, the way that James is describing here. God is equitable and God is just. You may pity them today, but you want an eternity. They're going to pity us. And I know as I think about that tonight, I know I'm going to be embarrassed one day at how many tests I failed throughout my life. When a temptation came, and, and you know, Satan was using it as a temptation, God used it as a test, an opportunity, and I blew it. How many tests I failed throughout my life. But I say that tonight, you know, this is challenging me because tomorrow is a new day. There's some tests coming tomorrow for me. I want to pass those tests. I want you to pass those tests. There's tests coming for you. Your test will be different than my test. It may be big, it may be small, but tomorrow is a new day with new opportunities. And I'd also add to this, you know, let us remember as we're thinking about this, remember that Jesus scored perfectly on our behalf. And we should never cease to live in thankfulness. Because Christ, the reason I have hope in eternity is because Christ scored perfectly on my behalf. He passed the test perfectly for my sake, and he paid for my failures on the cross. That's why we should live in perpetual gratitude to him. But as we close tonight, you know, you're reading through this passage of Scripture, and, you know, I want our discussion to not to be very practical. James is giving practical instructions, but, I, but do you see how this wades into the deep things of God? God's eternal purposes and sovereign plan in the events of our lives. Do you see how that's happening here, how God's sovereignty is on, on display? Of, you, you think these events are just you look back over your life and you think all these things just happened randomly nothing happened randomly God was sending tests and trials throughout your life to strengthen your faith and when you failed that was, it was to strengthen you to show maybe to teach you humility that when you failed and God forgave you and he picked you back up and, and gave you another opportunity God's sovereign plan his eternal purposes are at work in the events of our lives and we begin to see that as we go through this book of James so we we have a lot to learn in this letter but we're going to stop with that tonight and split up into our groups 